Hello everyone and welcome to Geek's Camp, the home of RPG goodness and general tomfoolery. My name is Zach, and uh, for the second time this day, I have the delight of being joined by a co-host, Shadow Zach. Zach Allen, how you doing? Good, how's it going? I am doing uh, even better than I was an hour ago, and I hope to repeat this again. Um, it's, it's, it's a great afternoon of chats. It is, right on. Yeah, and then uh, we are with... Uh, with a new creator that we have not had the pleasure of interviewing with at all yet on the show, which is which is kind of a shame because uh, uh, this is a this is an individual that we tried to get on a little while back with a different project and and just in general and it didn't quite work out. So we're back again and this time round two worked. Uh, Gabrielle, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Zach. Nice meeting you guys. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we kind of start off when we have a new creator. Uh, I like to get to know you more than more than to get to know your stuff right out the gate, right? Um, so one of the things that I know from looking at your stuff, though, is that you have a wide array of things that fascinate you that you bring to the RPG space. Because um, there's all sorts of things from card games about monks to uh, this, you know, science fantasy and tech noir and 80s biker gangs and like all sorts of stuff what what do you think is like the essence of of gaff like what what what's what's what what do you think kind of draws all that together who who are you i guess is the good question <laughs> yeah i think that i like uh, art in a very broad term and I, I like cinema a lot and i like horror movies and i like sci-fi science fiction and i like fantasy a lot so I guess that between those three genres, I can uh, switch my, man my mindset and have a different game experience from each of them. So I'm, I'm constantly like switching off from one genre to another. And the same thing goes with literature or with art in general. Mm. Yeah. So cinema, literature, art, kind of those are the things that you find yourself obsessing about a lot. And then yes, drawing yes, that absolutely. Obsession. Yeah. In, in its broadest, uh, most uh, amplified term ever. It's like, uh, I, I dig everything, uh, really everything, uh, even music also a lot. Mm -hmm. I, my, my, my playlists are very like eclectic and very mixed up. I think that eclecticism is uh, a very important part of what I do. Mm. Uh, so trying to stick with just one thing is very difficult with me because uh, it's, it always opens up. If you talk about horror, it opens up in so many subgenres, and maybe you have to choose or pick three or four subgenres and try to make the best out of those. Mm -hmm. And I, al I also always think in, in terms of art as a multidisciplinary form or try to tackle each product from different angles and from uh, the different perspectives that comes from uh, various artists. So I work with, usually I work with uh, several artists for each project that were uh, handpicked by me specifically because I want their input uh, on my projects. Hmm. Um, do, you yeah. see, do you see yourself, uh, that's interesting that you said that, do you see yourself, I know it's probably a mixed bag, but do you see yourself as an artist or writer, a game designer? Like what's the, what's the title that you most, associate with yes yeah, sometimes i'm also a community manager or whatever i have to i think that uh, today we need to do everything in order to survive so i i can be a writer i can be a graphic designer i can handle social media i need to do my numbers right in order to make some money and survive from this uh, so yeah i'm a jack of all trades i, I try to be I love that. Uh, you started this this talk of who you are with talking about cinema and your love for cinema, and you brought up you brought up horror, sci-fi, and fantasy. Um, I think I think you're in good company there. Uh, Zach is Zach is an extreme horror film uh, aficionado, and I would say that I am light toe dip into that, but heavy into the sci-fi side of things. Um, but what what are some like, what are some of your favorite, you don't have to name your, you don't have to decide on an absolute favorite, but like, what are some of those, that's a wide array of genres, but what are some of your favorite films uh, across that? 
I think that to answer that type of question, I, I could only say what's what I'm go, I'm being obsessed uh, right now. Yeah. What's obsessing yeah. me right now? Yeah. Because what I'm I am working on currently. Yeah. Uh, for example, um, I like very much. Uh, I am watching a lot lately. Uh, have are you familiar, Zach, with the rubber reality films as a subgenre? Uh, I think that uh, in some way you can say rubber reality is. Um, Hellraiser, yeah, uh, yeah, things that maybe challenge uh, the perception of the main character, and as they go forward with the narrative, everything starts to dilute and and change. Uh -huh. Well, I don't know if you uh, see video, video drum, video drum is a very emblematic, yeah, from that. Genre. Okay, I was gonna say, I, I don't know if you can see on the camera here, but I'm wearing my exalted uh, or, or my um, uh, uh, event horizon shirt. Uh, ah, yeah, well, so, uh, you yeah, so I think we're, uh, yeah, I, I get what you're, yeah, Hellraiser and, and, and whatnot. Yeah, I, I hey, well, you, you could say that Event Horizon is a rubber reality in space. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Interesting. Um, why do you think you like that? Like, what's the what's the piece of that that draws you the most at the moment? There is also a very good movie called Jacob's Ladder. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh -huh. I super recommend it. Have you seen it, Zach? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a very strong film. Uh, well, that's rubber reality, spot on. And I, what's interesting about all that, I think that um, hmm, challenging our perception of the world uh, as it is, I think that's that's very interesting. I think that it puts you out, definitely out of the comfort zone. And I think that uh, going out of the comfort zone is a very good thing for everyone. Maybe your racer head. Especially for creatives or artists. Yeah, mm, very much. Yeah, Zach, you've mentioned a racer head to me several times. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's yeah. a weird one. The whole David Lynch catalog is quite raw reality. Oh, yes, yes. Um, I, I I love. Um, I'm glad you brought you, you know that idea of like making you like re re look at the world around you. Um, mm -hmm. One of my favorite types of science fiction is the golden age of sci-fi, where it was way less science and way more speculative. And a big part of what they would do, right, is they would say, what if we changed this one thing about how the world works, right? And we would just shift <laughs> that one thing and we would see how that might unravel society or culture around it. And by yeah, doing how that, would society uh, relate to that? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Maybe that one thing is how we look at violence or war or something like that, but just kind of twist it a little bit and then just see. And by the end of it, you as the reader, you 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 see that the whole world changes, maybe in bizarre ways, maybe in, in cool ways, maybe in detrimental ways, by just mm -hmm. one thing being shifted, and that allows you to kind of maybe view that specific facet of reality from a different lens. Yeah, you know, I just really dig that sort of. <laughs> yeah, speaking speaking out loud or thinking about what you're saying, I think that uh, one of the differences is that this particular subgenre, I think that deals with the absurd in such a light manner uh, it does not care about explaining many, many things and that's also quite interesting what it does to our mind if you you think about our own reality we don't understand much of it but we sort of uh, absorb it anyway or go with the flow and sometimes in films we need to, everything to make sense or we need to understand why uh, anything is happening at all and uh, raw reality does uh, does uh, that a lot you know so maybe something will come out of the wall I, and say a statement that does not make much sense, but it still happens, and it's like uh, like mind fucking you constantly, you know. <laughs> and that's a, in, an interesting aspect of this of the genre that does not happen in science fiction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm, I I like this a lot, um, Zach. I have a, I have another question. I want to give you an opportunity here. Anything that um, anything that you want to add to that or branch off from that on? Uh, no, let's just keep plowing forward. Perfect, perfect, awesome. Well, so, so my my kind of the next phase of that is so I I adore all the things that you're talking about. I find these similar things at least fascinating. Um, what what is the thing that draws you then to take your love for cinema and your current obsession with you know these sorts of different looks at reality and put that into the RPG? world like what's the what's the impetus for that for for putting in the time and work and art to into this particular medium 
Well, I think that uh, RPGs are one of the most uh, interesting mediums uh, to, to tackle art. Because uh, if you think about it, it has everything. It has uh, illustration, it has uh, literature. Uh, you can combine it with music pretty easily. For example, all my games have their own soundtrack. They have their own albums. Uh, the front page, the front page comes with a QR that takes you directly to a Spotify playlist that can last eight hours. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can use that for your own sessions. So uh, you can you can uh, approach it from many different uh, art forms and still um, empower that uh, that feeling or that concept you want to create with that particular RPGs. And if you take that uh, with the experience of, of role playing itself, that is basically to me basically it's pretty basically it's like drama or, mm -hmm. or doing theater, but in a very improvised way and uh, maybe handled through through a system uh, but essentially it's an it's a drama but for at, mm -hmm. at least for me at least the way we play it uh, yeah. i fully emphasize the importance of always speaking from your character and never breaking character and speaking from the i not from the he uh, mm -hmm. so we enjoy it a lot and i think that also that's uh, another art form that it's uh, it, it, in, in, intermingles with uh, with RPGs, um, so they are great. They are great in, in 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 so multifaceted, no? So multidisciplinary. It's the, uh, it's the junction point. It's the it's the it's the collision point for all the other things that you for for, for everything. Because even when you see my books, it's like okay, is this a manual? Not not so much. Okay, is it just an art book? No. It's yeah. also uh, another thing. Okay, what does it have? It has literature. It has a story. It has uh, monologues. It has poems. It has essays. Mm -hmm. It has so much that it like breaks most categories. And I'm very interested in doing that, in uh, challenging that. We were just talking about Hell Knight um, here before you hopped on. And it was interesting you brought up the QR code. I, I gravitated to that immediately looking at um, on the first page you have the QR code and right above it, it says our music. Um, and I'm like, that's cool. Like right front and center. It's, it's an auditory component to this uh -huh. RPG giving, getting a, a, it's not tucked into the back or tucked into a sideline or a margin. It is given an opportunity to be center stage uh, at the beginning. Well, of the re re real musicians took uh, their time to, to make a, a song specifically for that, for Hell Knight. Uh -huh. yeah. And it is their input into that. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, it's cool. Very important, at least for me. Uh, and also, when I do the, my creative process, I am also constantly watching that specifically kind of cinema that uh, appeals to me for that project and listening to that specific music, so I can like uh, stay on the same uh, tune, no, mm -hmm. with what I'm doing, and not disperse so much, not de deviate. Yeah, and I, I find that you know you were you were talking about having you know eclectic taste in things and and that being very important to your process and all that um i think i find that this conjunction of all these different mediums in tabletop rpgs especially that you're seeing now that being able to pull from a whole bunch of different sources whether it be music that's inspiring you to write something or something that you read that's inspiring you to create a piece of music it's all kind of I, I'm really loving seeing how all these artists and creators are using all of their all of their tools and inspirations at their disposal to create these big and not big, but these complex pastiches of passion. And and I think that's something that's really interesting about Hell Knight and this this sigil game that you've created. It, it you know with your playlists and the way that you do the art, um, the way that you're pulling from all the different things is very very interesting. The thing that I, that I love about that also, um, as we're thinking about this, is it's a, it's the other thing about a conversion point is it's not just for you. It's not just for Gab. Mm -hmm. It's not just for Zach. It is that convergence point of all these different mediums of expression and passion. Mm -hmm. um, encourage people to take up elements of that passion or those mediums for themselves that wouldn't mm -hmm. otherwise be. As an example, I'm thinking about um, uh, we are friends with Harlan uh, with Bog Wizard, uh, the the band, and you know he comes in as a passionate 
supporter and enthusiast for the Morkboard game. But because of his passion and because there was room in the Morkboard community for his music, now he mm-hmm. is also given opportunities and use, utilizing those opportunities to explore writing, right? And, and game design. And to me, that's so cool to see mm-hmm. um, that, that our little space encouraged a creative to find new outlets for their for that for that piece of themselves yeah, yeah absolutely the way that uh, we influence each other that's mm-hmm. uh, that uh, that means that it is a movement indeed or a revolution uh, in the way that we we create mm. yeah yeah exactly yeah and 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 i think that that's kind of the cool thing when people come into this industry. My dad, uh, Zach had the opportunity. My dad came to his very first RPG convention with us uh, this year. He'd never played an RPG before, never watched one played. He said, I want to come experience a convention with you guys and see what, what this is all about. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, he's a, he's an English teacher. He loves literature. He loves writing, but he's never done anything. He comes to the convention and he says, uh, by Friday, I think it was Zach. He he said, I would love to find. I would love to play. We were sitting across the, the way from an uh, 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 the, Flag Bearer Games crew, which make a revolution American Revolution RPG. And uh-huh. he said, Oh, I would love to try that. I think I would love to experience an RPG. And one thing led to another, and that table ended up being full later that evening. And I instead dropped him and the rest of us into an alien game and we played oh. alien rpg which is completely different right and he had, <laughs> yes he hadn't seen the alien rp the alien films in probably 20 years and you know it's kind of a distant well at least he has seen it yeah exactly at least he had a little bit of a touch point but but what was interesting there is you know that that convention was in uh dc uh, washington dc and we live in kansas city so we had we had a a 20 hour drive home that next day. Ooh. And my dad spent, I would say eight to 10 hours of that drive home talking about how revelatory, how illuminating uh-huh. that experience was, how fascinated he found it, how he appreciated the narrative um, capabilities of the game master who was able to weave a story together collaboratively, taking input, mm-hmm. how he noticed, he noticed Zach and our friend Eric and different people like, assisting in that narrative and empowering other people to have moments and the story that came out of it was cohesive right um (laughs) and to me that was such a cool thing to see someone who had no touch point here really with an rpg walk away from it saying this is an art form and it's an art form for expression it's an art form that requires skill but it also has space for passion and for (laughs) raw enthusiasm yeah, 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 absolutely. And, and also, I think I have to say that uh, specifically the alien RPG is a, is a beauty. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because uh, the, the system is awesome. The setting is mind blowing. The book is awesome as well. Yeah. yeah. So it's uh, the experience has to be amazing. Yeah. To and, play and that. I'm a big fan of the alien series. So for sure. Yeah. I, I have it. I have it. I love it. The... I love it very much. Uh, I, I think that, as you said, it's also very important. Um, to me, it's key that uh, people can join in uh, the community and start playing without so su- such a big uh, such such a big problem learning the system. You know, mm-hmm. so uh, at least half of my play testers are non RPG players. They mm-hmm. they started with me, and that's, that, that's awesome. I think that that's very good. Let's talk about that for a minute. Let's talk about introducing people that have never played an rpg before to this how do you there's probably several different ways of doing it but how do what do you feel like you just talked about making sure that it's not a heavy amount of mechanics and learning a system but what do you think is the best way to to introduce someone to this to this hobby to me the best way is uh well as you just said uh, we need to we need a system that needs to be super easy uh, and it's to fade away in the background. And um, I always explain it as just pretend you are this character and let me know uh, what are your decisions. Interpret your character. Assume that character mm-hmm. for at least two hours, uh, the length of our session. And it kind of works. It, I think. it goes yeah. back to that the idea of theater that you talked about mm-hmm. before, right? Which yeah. Is, they'll lean into that. that that's, that's my approach to it. 
I will say though that with the alien RPG, I think part of the reason that you and I am in the same, I think that the alien RPG, I said it in the last podcast, I'll say it again here. Uh, the alien RPG is the best conversion of a brand of a of a of a of an IP to the RPG and maintain being able to bring everything over. It feels mm-hmm. when you play the R- alien RPG, it feels like you're playing yeah. through exactly the same sorts of stories as you remember watching. And I think a big <laughs> part of that is that the, the, the system is not robust, but it is the design of the system is that the mechanics reinforce the narrative that you're trying to the narrative. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they move you forward. Exactly. Mm-hmm. They are not like, like, uh, I love little minimal systems. We just played a game on stream last week that it uses just a single die for everything. Um, I love that. I also, but I really also love systems that say we are still playing a game. There's, there's definitely mm-hmm. role play storytelling narrative to this, but at the mm-hmm. end of the day, there's also, it's a role playing game and the game part should feed into the role play and the role play should feed into the game. And the best, the way that that happens is by acknowledging that every time you pick up dice, this is an opportunity. It's not a it's not a frustrating thing to pick up dice. It's an opportunity <laughs> for those dice and for the designer of this game to help you create the experience that you're all hoping to achieve. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And it's mm-hmm. I think I think we have talked about uh briefly or maybe we just had a chat after uh one of our recordings recently where we talked about the cinematic uh elements of certain systems and and uh, games and things like that. And I think what we're seeing now is a lot of systems being crafted where no matter how the dice fall, whether you succeed or fail on a roll, it's going, the narrative outcome of that is going to move the story forward instead of grinding things to a halt mm-hmm. like some other traditional RPGs. Yeah, yeah. That, that, I think that uh, that takes me back specifically to Tulu Dark from Graham Walmsley. And he designed uh, a new a new system for uh, Cthulhu, uh, mm-hmm. the Lovecraft setting, that was specifically about that uh, that y- you never fail when trying to find a clue or when investigating something, you mm-hmm. always at least found something that makes the story go forward. Right. Uh, and yeah, yeah, I think that that's awesome. Yeah, we need the story to go forward, specifically in these days that uh, the, the dungeon master or the director does not have so much time to to make uh, the homework, no? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm like, we, we, we like low prep sessions. At least I sure. like low prep sessions and I like to improvise a lot. Mm-hmm. But we need those kind of systems that help us do that. We're also, it's a recognition I think in the industry right now that we, we came out of uh, the tactical war game community where numbers, math, and um, uh, the meta aspect of looking at a battlefield and evaluating for best best decision and the right mm-hmm. decision and all that mm-hmm. is an important facet. And if you look at even games that were designed, I think even maybe 10 years ago, a big part of the core framework of design is still around, this is a game where there is a right decision and the tactical decision is often the right decision. And mm-hmm. Yeah. The, whether it's the monsters or the NPCs or even the player characters, their their stats, their abilities, their whatever are communicating, hey, first and foremost, there's a win condition here that we're mm-hmm. trying to achieve. Yeah. But now we're seeing, and I think a great example, Alien's a great example. The other one's a great example is the um, Star Wars, the Edge Star Wars system that has mm-hmm. the, the dice um, that are storytelling dice that have no numbers on them and are all icons and those icons aren't meant to say you deal X amount of damage necessarily. It's more mm. about saying, this is how the story moves forward from here. Cause you can, you can, you can have mm. that, that minor amount, uh, you could fail forward, um, right. As a big part of that game, uh, mm-hmm. that the dice will actually say that not with numbers, mm-hmm. but, but with icons and expressions with and, items, yeah. and, and, um, and then with, with RPG design and with adventure design, I think we're also moving into, I mean, again, all the, I, it's just going to be unfortunate, but I'll, I'll, I'll reference the Blade Runner RPG, I guess, for this. But like how we're writing RPGs now a lot of times is a, more in the style of a cinematic experience or a narrative experience where we're talking about acts, right? Act one, uh-huh. act two. We're talking about, yeah. we're talking about scenes, right? Um, what we're, not, what we're yeah. not talking about is, you know, 10 minute rounds or sessions or whatever, or, um, uh, uh, grids 
right? Which are very much not storytelling terms. They are uh, meta mechanical tactical terms. Right. And I think it's exciting yeah. to me to see not just creatives, like creatives have always been in the space, but now creatives are getting to use storytelling language as their game design philosophy. And uh -huh. that is, that is, I think, just a, the most cool thing that's happened in the last, that's really taken storm in the last five to 10 years is saying, here's where we want RPGs to go, at least at, in a, a big chunk of RPGs. And we're going to make sure that we develop a language or take hold of a language from film and, and, and storytelling in general or novels. We're going to take hold of that language and we're going to bring it into ours so that we also bring that same essence. Ah, just so cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And also, uh, I'm sure you're familiarized with the concept of the yes and and the no but and, and all that. Mm -hmm. And that's that also comes from uh, drama and theater. Yes. So it's a relatively new inclusion uh, into the uh, into the concept uh, of playing. At, at least it must have ten years or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Pretty yeah. sure. Yeah. It's, and I think it's reinforced by. It's been reinforced by. Uh, the popularity of streamed games and, and games recorded games in general and those a lot of those people whether that's critical role or other c communities being theater people performative people who are saying the thing that's going to capture the imagination and bring the audience along with us is not anything but telling a good story so how the do story we, yeah how do we make sure that nothing gets in the way of the story and everything that mm. we are doing all the mechanics or or pieces are there to propel the story forward mm -hmm. um, it's rare i find it very rare that um my groups of players come out of a session and talk about anything that they enjoyed other than a moment where a story a significant story moment that happened they rarely mm -hmm. talk about how cool it was that they rolled a 20 and they got to use this ability and this thing happened over here, right? Well, well, well the biggest the biggest difficulty to find uh, new players is exactly always the system. That's mm -hmm. the biggest problem. Uh, they have uh, Maybe they have some difficulty to understand how it works and why this system uh, relates to the story. I, mm -hmm. I think that uh, that's the, where the difficult li difficulty lies. But if you fade that away, I maybe uh, help them a bit with uh, with a very light system that maybe they don't understand it a hundred percent, but they can relax and just go with the story. I think that that's where the magic is, where the mm. goal is. And very, it, it hasn't happened to me so far that uh, somebody tries that out and does not love it. No, mm -hmm. uh, to me, it's always a good experience to 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 role play. Maybe they don't continue doing it but they always have a very uh, a memorable experience out of it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. um looking at i'm gonna i'm gonna circle bring this back around to as we talk about different types of games looking at your array of of projects that you've put out and i i may not know all of them i mainly know the ones that have came to kickstarter um but uh, I mentioned before that you have a wide array. You have Warpland. Um, you have, um, is it called Aset, um, which is the the monks one? Am I saying that right, or I probably am bungling that? No, I, I made that word up, so you can say it. Okay. As you like. Yeah, yeah. It's which a made I, up word. Which I think is a beautiful, beautiful game. I re I remember you. I think you did uh, some you, videos Zach. videos about it, uh, leading up to it, and I saw some pictures of you playing it, and I'm like, wow, this is a just a it's a game that feels it feels like the type of thing that it's also trying to present. Does that make sense? Where you know, yes. you're talking about monks searching for enlightenment and then the aesthetic of this game feels like it enforced that. But it's completely different than Warpland, right? And then you follow up this Yeah. Well well, well I want to say about Asset that has something that's very peculiar because you can either play Asset uh, without uh, doing numbers, without worrying about the math. And without having that advantage, just relax and go and have fun. Yep. Or you can play asset like a fucking like like if it were chess, and go crazy trying to <laughs> to have a little advantage over the game. Yeah. So I think that uh, we managed to do that uh, nicely. Yeah, I like that about the game. Yeah. <laughs> so so you follow up this this game of uh that that's beautiful and minimalistic, then with Helmet, mm. which is wild. 
and, and, and a whole different approach to everything. Um, uh, it, well, at least in, in some ways. Um, I, I think what's interesting to me is the diversity here. And we've already talked about why that diversity might happen because you have a lot of taste and you have a lot of things that you enjoy. How do you, I, I'm sure, uh, at least for me, I know my own tendencies that I have probably six or eight or 10 projects that I am enthusiastic about at any one time. How do you choose which one gets to move forward that you're going to put your energy into and actually like put out into the world? I think I, 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 I also have the same problem. I have like three or four projects going around and I think that I just, uh, okay, when I wake up, I say, okay, what do I want to do? Okay, I want to do that. I tackle it and see where it takes me. And I try to move forward in the most uh, professional possible way that allows it. But uh, I think that I give it uh, the space and amount of energy they they need. Uh, of course, I, I need to take in con into consideration uh, the chances that that project will be finished and the amount of work I will have to do to accomplish that. Uh, some projects, they demand a lot of time and a lot of money and a big budget. Yep. And some projects are much more easier to do. So I know that I can handle them uh, a bit quicker. For example, with the Sigil, uh, I have been working on that project for the last two years, but uh, it comes and goes. For example, one month I would be, uh, half of my time will be devoted to Sigil and the other half will be devoted to maybe Hell Knight or Neurosity, the, the new version I just yep. did that will be printed uh, end of the month. So uh, I think that I need to take into consideration many, many things. The, the time I want, what I want to do, because it's difficult to fake it. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's I, I, I'm, I cannot fake it. Can we, can we talk <laughs> about that for a minute? I think I remember, and forgive me if I'm remembering this wrong, because it's been a little while. But I think I remember a great update post on the Hell Knight Kickstarter where you talked about this. Am I remembering this correctly? <laughs> I don't remember. Maybe there was a. Yeah. <laughs> if it wasn't, if it wasn't, uh, if it wasn't Gav, it was, it was, it was somebody else in the same space. But there was a great update where you, it was talking about deadlines and about multiple projects, or maybe a little bit was mentioned there. But it was basically a statement of like, look, this is a work of a, from a creator, from a creative, yes. yeah. and the the priority here is that it it comes out the way you Sorry. want it. To, oh, you're good. You're good. I need to plug the computer. You're good. <laughs> yeah. The priority uh, was, I think, that you you said like, "Hey, I'm a creative, and I want this project to be exactly how I imagine it." And mm -hmm. sometimes that means that it doesn't deliver on the deadline or on the whatever. But it, what's important here is that for me, is that you're that that it's the thing that I have envisioned, and and mm -hmm. on the back end, it's important that us as backers recognize that we're funding a creative process, which is by necessity a loose yes. um, process that is built upon passion and passions ebb and flow and shift. And they mm. sometimes change completely um, mm -hmm. before the end. Um, and certainly it's hard to put passion on a timeline, even though that's kind of what, what we're asked to do when it comes to the Kickstarter. Mm. Field. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At the very least, we need to find a balance, but it's it's very really correct that it's difficult sometimes to uh, explain the backers that it's not that they're going to a store and buying a game. They're buying an idea. Um, specifically for me, I like uh, just develop the concept of that idea uh, when I do the campaign. So I have a pile, a very big pile of notes and of uh, art references for that book, and I have already played that book but not much about that so i have not written the book yeah and maybe it will end up being 60 pages uh, like hell knight and and then it went up to 150 yeah or more and that happens uh, if i feel like um, I, I have something going on yeah uh, it's a bit like uh, surfing mm -hmm. right away to see where it takes you <laughs> do you enjoy the when it comes time when you've developed a project to the point where you say i think this is one that is going to go out into the world do you enjoy the process of kickstarter and and crowdfunding in general or is that a hurdle that you must overcome um in your mind 
So I used to go a lot to the to the casinos, uh, you know, with my father. I <laughs> I used to travel a lot with my father. Uh, I went to many casinos, uh, and I end up li liking playing blackjack or roulette. And that's what I feel with uh, with Kickstarters, you know. The, um, it's like okay, let's see what happens with this. Maybe uh, people will become aware and will love the project, or maybe I don't know. It's uh, difficult to predict, at least for me. I know there is a big uh, aspect of advertising and moving forward with with all the social networking that comes with presenting a new project. But sometimes it's like, what the fuck? Okay, I'm going to. If people notice what's going on, uh, that's going to adapt for the project. And if it, they don't notice, okay, let's move on. Let's let's keep going. <laughs> it's, it's 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 probably even harder. Um, again, someone who has seen a lot of this. Uh, so I don't know if you know this, Gabriel. This is definitely. But I'm saying this because many people like become too stressed about it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It's like, oh, it's, this has been a nightmare. This has been, okay, take it easy, man. You cannot create in that state. Mm -hmm. And I need to create a, 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 with my campaign because I'm constantly adjusting the budget of my campaign to what I'm going to develop in the end. Yeah. So I, I cannot be, ah, I'm going because it's, yeah, I'm going to die from a heart attack. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and I, I was going to say, like, one of the things I've noticed um, is, we when a when a creator is a let's say a mothership rpg creator um and mm -hmm. that's really where the heart of their passion lies is with a specific system it's it, then their kickstarters kind of escalate they as long as they're putting out quality stuff it escalates and builds and it becomes a consistent thing to where at least to some extent they know they can guess what the next project is going to fund at what i find cool or interesting <laughs> about folks like you and other people that we talk to and to some extent myself is that we get these these bee in our bonnets. We get these itches that we've got to scratch that are completely different. And when yes. that happens, we have no idea, right? Yes, it's impossible. Hell, Hell Knight can be. I think Hell Knight got like twelve hundred backers, right? But the next project that you put out um, was not Hell Knight related, right? It, it was uh, Neurosity. Yeah, and the update knows, version. Who knows how many of those Hell Knight supporters are gonna pop over and back a techno noir? rpg right yeah yeah and, and that to me is it, it, it you're you're playing kickstart we are playing kickstarter on hard mode a little bit because yeah. we're intentionally choosing to not be consistent in a lot of different ways um mm -hmm. and yeah and that's, that's yeah absolutely i agree with that it's a very cool thing anytime i look at a profile like yours and i say <laughs> this is a creator who has a diverse palette um that is, it's fascinating to me, and I, I, I root for you and, and for the others who, who are choosing to allow their creativity to take a lot of forms, understanding that that's going to mean that there are highs and lows, it, it, depending on... Uh, absolutely, and I think that that's where uh, what you're doing comes into, the, into play, because uh, thanks to uh, this kind of work you're doing now, to podcasts and channels, uh, we can grow some awareness about uh, independent artists uh -huh. yeah. and people that do uh, different things, no? Yeah. Maybe out of the main non-mainstream. Do you find it hard um, once you're through Kickstarter to get attention, that attention on your stuff again or to continue that? Or what has been your experience post-Kickstarter for your projects? How the attention about that project keep going on? Well, let's say let's use you know Warplander, or Asset or Hell Knight things that have came out. Like what's what yeah. do you feel is is to me it feels like the the there are different sorts of trials once you're through <laughs> the Kickstarter field about making sure that those projects have some sort of an ongoing life. Or there's <laughs> alternatively, I've definitely spoken with creatives who say I'm not worried about an ongoing life for every project. If it lives mm -hmm. and dies on Kickstarter and it's just this cool thing that happens in the moment, that's great. Yeah. I don't worry about it needing to exist mm -hmm. in perpetuity for everything. What's, what do you feel like on that post-Kickstarter? What's your typical mindset? Well, I, 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 at least my take is that uh, I really took uh, such an amount of effort and time and, and consciousness and whatever, focus, to develop something that uh, I think that I'm lucky to say that what eventually happens is that 
a small community starts building up around that setting. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we have Warbland. The, I, I know that many people have been playing Warbland for the last uh, two years in a very long ongoing campaign, and they are very big fans of that setting, but they have they don't care about playing Hell Knight at all. And for example, Warbland is uh, sold out in Exalted. Uh, it's pretty much sold out. At, at least I I sold out my stock of it. Uh -huh. Exalted Funeral must have left a hundred books. Um, it has been published in French and it's being reedited for the third time. So there is a big French community going around Warplan, much bigger than uh, the English speaking community. So, uh, yeah, they, it's like uh, throwing your baby into the wild and see if it survives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No? Did you just say that? Maybe the baby grows. I think that most of the time, if the work is super cool, uh, it will grow like Morborg, like Morborg, Morborg Creek keeps growing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. uh, and I, 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 I think that, you know, it's in my own mind, it's certainly a reality that not every project is going to grow. And, and certainly, I mean, this is not the reality, but um, there's there's projects that I personally make or that I see come out, Hell Knight being one of them, that I'm like, man, I yeah. really... I but for, for example, with Hell Knight, I'm constantly being pushed to release more material. And it's, uh, well, what I'm going, writing now, uh, called the Black Rainbow Society, is going to be a spin-off series set in the Hell Knight universe. I'm also releasing now a, a cardboard pamphlet uh, that is going to be another duty class for Hell Knight. Um, what else? Well, Sigil, the card game, is set in Hell Knight. So the thing keeps growing and like uh, keeps growing limbs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, that, that, that's, that's what I want for this type of a game. Especially like, uh, I'm going to commend you for just a moment. I know we, we've kind of talked about a lot of things, but I'm going to commend you too. When I got Hell Knight in, um, immediately you know you see a lot of pictures on the updates and on the kickstarter page and you know you're going to like the book i'm not ever really worried about liking something or not that comes in that i back but what it pressed me right out the gate is like this is a book that's designed from the different coatings that you put on it um and and especially just looking at the cover right out the gate there's a lot of thought that went into this cover that may not be apparent when you look at it online or whatever right but like <laughs> There is several different textures. There's several, there's a few different coatings, like, and all of that communicated to me. This is a book whose creator d designed something that, giving it every possible chance to last and to grow, right? Like, uh -huh. this is a this yeah. is the right. This is a yeah, yeah. best step forward sort of a thing, right? Like, it's not like oh, we'll toss something out there and we'll see if it sticks. It's like I'm going to toss the best possible version of Hell Knight that I can out there. And give yeah, it the best it's meant that. Thank you, Zach, for acknowledging it. Thank you very much for the kind words. Uh, it really means a lot to me. But yeah, absolutely. I, I, I uh, work with artists that understand that there are different levels of attention yeah. and, and perception when you absorb that kind of work. So maybe you just have want to do the first layer, the first time you read Hell Knight, then the second layer, then the third. It can be, there might be a fourth. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah it's so. It works in many degrees. Like, yeah, I love that. I like that a lot. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, so so we're kind of getting towards the end here, um, and uh, I wanna I wanna do a couple things. As I as I mentioned uh, to you before we did the recording, a big part of this is like I really enjoyed our conversation. Um, I really enjoyed this chat. I've been looking forward to it for ever since you reached out to me, actually, um, and. Folks are, if folks also enjoy this and if they say, you know, Gabrielle has cool ideas or these books sound cool or whatnot, then what we'd like to do is say, hey, how do you, how do we, how do we call those people to action? How do we get them to move forward into supporting the community, helping grow the Hell Knight community or whatever? So I know you have a Kickstarter that's live right now. That's the Sigil, right? Um, mm -hmm. And that's for the uh, a card game um, that uh, uh, takes place in the same setting as hell knight um yeah um and so that's readily on kickstarter and you can go check that out if you want to check out yeah check out the, the theme is also a bit like a spin-off now because there are warlocks fighting to find the lost pages of a, 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 a demonic grimoire mm -hmm. uh, hmm. that's basically the the theme of sigil but yeah it's set in the hell knight universe yeah absolutely, absolutely. 
and um, it has that doom biker feel. It has a mm-hmm. doom biker feel. The cards feel like very like they're 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 not battered in reality, but like at least the prototypes or whatever that I see images of, like they're distressed looking and they feel like an art. Yeah, they're very really distressed like, looking. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Uh, that's that's my favorite aesthetic by a long <laughs> shot so you had me there um but so there sigil is something that people can go check out um it's still got several weeks as of this uh recording in it so you can go uh go back it there where could people if people wanted to grab hell knight or some of your other stuff you mentioned exalted funeral is that like an mm-hmm. ideal spot for people to go pick up your stuff yes exactly funeral has a hell knight and warplan in their hardcover deluxe versions and they will have neurosity the colorblind edition uh, next month. So yeah, if you want my deluxe products, uh, you can find them in Exalted Funeral. If not, you can go to Drive Through RPG and check me out. But yeah, I'm also available in my, all my social media, Facebook or Instagram. Just put Gabriel Quiroga, and there are not many of me. I was gonna yeah. say. I was gonna say, um, <laughs> Gav is. I, I was uh, my recommendation to our listeners is whether or not you go and buy Hell Knight or back Sigil or anything else. Um, Gav is a really great person to connect with on social media because it's it, I, he you put out a lot of really cool posts. I think I mentioned several. Times <laughs> this, but like, um, you're a value add to to the the social feed. And uh, thank you. I have fun. I try to have fun. Yeah, yeah, it's great. <laughs> uh, so get you know bare minimum. Go give this man. Uh, go connect with this man on socials because because you'll enjoy it. Um, yeah, thank you so much for hanging out with us. I really appreciate yeah. it. No, thank you, Sax. Thank you very much for the invitation, and I hope we can chat again and discuss more about our geekness. Let's do that for sure. Yeah, yell at, <laughs> yell at me whenever. We'll make it happen. 